Welcome to the New Books Network. It's a joy to be with Dr. Christopher Bellito, who's uh, someone I, uh, I've known for years and who's uh, been very helpful for me as a, as a greenhorn editor of, of a book because uh, Dr. Bellito ed- uh, is the general editor of a very beautiful series called Braille Companions to the Christian Tradition. And he has been doing that for 13 years along with being a professor of history at King University in New Jersey. And uh, because he has so much time on his hand, uh, being, <laughs> by being, a, you know, he, he wrote also a book. He just uh, finished, you know, did a book, a beautiful book called Humility, The Secret History of a Lost Virtue. And um, I thought reading the book, and, and when I first saw the title, I thought, what a timely book uh, what a necessary book in the current context and um i'm going to pass the microphone to him so to speak and ask him why he chose to write this book and how he approached it and what he wanted to achieve with this book well Please. thanks for having me it's a it's a pleasure to be here and to and to be uh working together in a different way in a different mm-hmm. key than we were as uh, as author and editor uh so this book was not deliberately written in reaction to current events. Um, timing works out. Uh, but I, I, like many people, they discover the next book while they're writing the previous book. And so my previous book to this one was published in 2016, and it was called Ageless Wisdom, uh, where I read through the Bible and tried to get a sense of the interplay of age and wisdom. Uh, This was published by Paulist Press. Um, And I I had never read the Bible from the first word to the last word straight through. Um, And uh, as I was reading that, uh, I, I, along with wisdom, humility kept coming up. And for a while, I thought that I would put those two things together, but there was just so much to do with humility that it was almost detracting from the points I wanted to make about age and wisdom. So I did what I often do, which is get a box or a file folder that says next project and just started dumping the material in. And so when the next, this book came out in 2016, the next project was to get some release time from my own university uh, and for which I'm grateful to start uh, kind of drilling down So I knew that my topics was was going to be humility. Being an historian, I tend to to start, you know, at the beginning and move forward. So I did take a chronological approach rather than a thematic approach. Uh, All through the project, the working subtitle was a biography of a lost virtue. And uh, so in my mind, that's how I was kind of thinking about it. And then the editor at Georgetown University Press, Al Bertrand, who really helped, you know, uh, uh, take this book from where it was. And I I think he elevated it to the degree that it is elevated. That's Al's hand. And Al said that he thought secret history was a better way of looking at it. Um, And of course, that gives a certain uh intriguing notion and so i deferred to him as a publisher but the fact that it was a biography meant that i was moving chronologically so that was the second decision the first the topic the second the structure and then the third was audience so i i wanted to do piles and piles and piles of academic research but i also wanted to write a book that people would read so like you and like our listeners for whom i'm grateful Uh, We have all read very, very good 200-page novels that were unfortunately 300 pages long, or an excellent two-hour movie that was three and a half hours long. And so my goal was not to give you everything that I found. So at one point, when I was shopping the book around, another press uh, said to me, why didn't you write a 400-page book on humility? And I said, because I want people to read it. Um, and I deliberately was writing for kind of a broader audience. So yes, there are footnotes, but I give two examples instead of 22. If I was writing an academic book, I would have given 22. So it comes out to about 180 pages, but I hope that that 180 pages is full, but not dense. 
And, and luckily, the National Endowment for the Humanities has a grant that I, I think is only a few years old called the Public Scholar Grant. And it is to support projects that are deliberately written for a broader audience to kind of rate. I don't like this notion that we're, that we're watering things down. I think what we're doing is raising the level of conversation. Um, and so at the uh, end, I was supported by um, this public scholar grant, which married with a sabbatical, allowed me to um, spend uh, a, 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 about eight months in um, uh, the, uh, the library at Princeton Theological Seminary, which is not far from my home. And since we had all been cooped up because of COVID for a number of years, when I rushed downstairs to tell my wife that I had won a sabbatical and this grant, she said, great, get out. Um, and so I was I was very grateful that Princeton gave me a uh, uh, a locked office and 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 borrowing privileges because you know as you're writing you always have to look up that last thing and and access to their databases so there were a lot of people who kind of uh, helped me with this with this book so that's the kind of the genesis of the project oh thank you uh, so let's delve into the book and and uh, try to get a grasp of the argument um, maybe I should ask you about the general gist of the argument right before we delve into the each of the so we'll start with the prologue and then we'll go through the different chapters and as you said the chapters are somewhat chronological yeah is there a general so in the Go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, so in part of the problem when you write a book, I mean, when I give book talks, I always, my opening line is that this is not a lab. Um, this is not, you know, I'm so humble and you can be too. Uh, I was trained by Jesuits. They taught me a lot of things and humility wasn't necessarily one of them. Uh, so I'm not at all, that's the problem, right? So so the, the epigram which starts the book is a Yiddish proverb that I got from a, a, a dialogue partner, a Jewish rabbi, with whom I've been giving presentations for years, who's a close friend, and it's the Yiddish proverb, too humble is half proud. Uh, it's, it's delicious, right? Too humble is half proud. And so the minute you start talking about humility, every joke in the book can start to come up. Um, so what's happened, I think, in the modern world is that the, that the virtue of pride has been mistaken for the vice of uh, the virtue of humility has been mistaken for the vice of hubris, thinking too much of yourself, or the vice of humiliation, thinking mm -hmm. too little of yourself. And I think that humility, I mean, lots of people, when, when Augustine is asked for the three most important virtues, he responds, humility, humility, and humility. Dante says it is the first mm -hmm. virtue. Uh, Hildegard of Bingen writes a play about the virtues in the 11th century, and none of the other virtues know what to do without humility. Humility is the captain of the team. And so there's a centrality to this particular virtue. And so what I found was that you've got these kind of twin competing strands in the ancient world. You've got, you've got a Judeo-Christian-Islamic tradition. And then you've got a Greco-Roman tradition, but it's not like the monotheists are good and the polytheists are bad because Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle really understand humility in a, in a very positive way that we can get into that say the Roman legions um, uh, did not. And, and I should add that this is not a book that is written for or not for people of faith because you don't have to be a person of faith to get the point of the story of Noah's Ark. Just as with Aesop's fables, you don't have to believe in talking animals to get the point that's being told by our parents when they told us, you know, these stories. So generally, um, in, in the ancient world, you have these competing strands. And the first is this, is this begins with the Hebrew tradition, where think of Moses taking his shoes off in the presence of Yahweh. He, he's, it, it, it's an acknowledgement, not so much of Moses' littleness as much of Yahweh's bigness. And Yahweh's bigness doesn't make Moses worthless. He just understands that there are things that are bigger 
than he is. And so that's represented by the scene, right? Where he sees, you know, the, the, the burning, the burning bush. And he says, you know, oh, I have to make some physical action to let Yahweh know that I'm recognizing that. And that is typically translated as the fear of God, which is a, a, a lousy translation, right? It's really, it's really awe in the face of something or someone greater. It's a disposition of reverence and obedience, which of course is absolutely central to Islam, right? The notion of submission and reverence and, and obedience. And so, you know, Moses, the lesson of Moses, I think, you know, which we get eventually in the book of Sirach is the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and that self-understanding doesn't mean self-deprecation. Um, and, and a good example of this is not so much Yom Kippur, but Erev Yom Kippur. So Erev Yom Kippur, Erev, the night before, the vigil of, the eve of. In the Jewish tradition, before you ask God for forgiveness on Yom Kippur, you ask those that you have uh, uh, harmed for forgiveness. It's a recognition that that in humility you go and say i made an error and i'm asking for your forgiveness now that might be a negative example let me give you a positive example so there's this terrific story about a talmud dispute um, that takes place when the babylonian talmud is being compiled so this is around the first century bce and there are two schools or groups of scholars one led by, uh, led by hillel and the other by uh, uh, Shammai, and they're arguing about a particular legal point, and they go on for three years. And then finally, Yahweh, via a voice from heaven, comes down and he says, Hillel gets it right. So, of course, they ask Yahweh, why? And the response, and I'm quoting here from the Talmud, uh, is uh, because Hillel's scholars were kindly and modest, they studied their own rulings and those of Beth Shammai and were even so humble as to mention the actions of Beth Shammai before theirs. So it's not, you know, we think our position is correct, but that doesn't mean that we can't learn from the other position and the other position isn't entirely incorrect. So I think that that's a positive intellectual example um, but of course, we can get this in any dispute that's occurring in our families or in our workplaces. So that's kind of the positive ancient strand. And the negative ancient strand is this word that the ancient Greeks use called hubris. And they use that for excessive pride, arrogance, mm -hmm. narcissism, of course, the famous story of Narcissus, the man mm -hmm. who was so in love with his own image that according to different versions, you know, he falls into a pool of water and drowns because he's looking at you know his own his own you know beauty and and to continue with a negative example look at the roman legion ritual of putting um uh the defeated under the yoke right so you've got three spears essentially the you know two is kind of the door jams and one is the lintel um it's kind of an ancient version of the limbo and and you as the defeated army must walk under this yoke as an act of humiliation. I mean, remember that the Roman army doesn't just beat you, you know, I mean, they put their foot on, on your neck and they, you know, stab you right in the heart while you're watching. And that's demeaning, right? To be a slave in the ancient world, manual labor is demeaning. So if I, if I can just continue there, it's very important to say at this point that this was not true of all Greeks, right? So Socrates is really, I open the book with Socrates and the famous story of the Delphic Oracle and uh, his friend uh, uh, Caraphon asking the Delphic Oracle, who's the smartest man in the world, who, uh, who's the wisest man in the world? Socrates, the next logical question, why? Because he knows that he knows nothing, right? Know thyself is the, um, is the, uh, uh, slogan over the Delphic Oracle. And mm -hmm. so, you know, this really freaks Socrates out. I mean, I'm quoting here from Plato's Apology. So, so what Socrates does is he goes around to all of these other people. He goes to politicians, he goes to artisans, he goes to poets. 
you know, and he discovers that each of those people knows what they do, carpenters, poets, whatever, but they don't know more than that, but they think they know more than that. Mm-hmm. So Socrates says, so I withdrew and thought to myself, I am wiser than this man. It's likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile, but he thinks he knows something when he does not. Whereas when I don't know, neither do I think I know. So I'm likely to be wiser than he to this small extent that I do not think I know what I do not know. Right? I mean, it's really so that, you know, that blows against the ancient, you know, Greco-Roman idea that the state of humility is humiliation, right? You are a slave, you are a prisoner, you're a POW, you don't have any dignity, you, you are less than, right? Lowliness is an absolute negative. And Aristotle, Socrates' intellectual grandson, of course, uh, I, I, I think people think that virtue is the opposite of vice. And of course, the way Aristotle laid this out is that virtue is between two means. Mm-hmm. So to give a different example, so, so bravery is between cowardice and recklessness. And so for Aristotle, when Aristotle talks about pride, he's actually talking about humility because he's talking about proper pride, the virtuous mm-hmm. mean the virtuous balance, we can kind of hear Confucius here, right? The doctrine of the mean. Mm-hmm. For Aristotle, proper pride is the virtuous mean or balance between the vices of thinking too much of yourself, mm-hmm. vanity, hubris, and thinking too little of yourself, humiliation. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, very, uh, Thank you for clarifying these two trajectories and... Um, as I was listening, I mean, one question that arose is there's still clear, there are clearly similarities, but there are also differences between these two traditions, right? Oh, and, absolutely. And um, because in many ways, the let's say the theistic or the Christian tradition, when you also talk about Islam and Judaism, seems to be a little more radical in many ways right that it's not you you as i read it you don't they don't talk about humility as a balance right it's it's a much right. it seems to me more more radical more and the more emphasis on self denial um Nevertheless, where the balance might arise is because you you in, you give several examples. Hildegard of Bingen is one of them. Uh, is that humility has to be understood in harmony with the other virtues, right? So it's in a way similar to the Greek or Roman view, or that virtue is an is a multiplicity entails other virtues as it's not just one, right? And you you cite a very beautiful just at the beginning of the book. Page two, humility is not humiliation. Humility is a virtue, not a vice. Isaac the Syrian, a wise seventh century person, described humility as itself humble. And what salt is to food, humility is to the virtues. But without humility, all our works are in vain. Humility, like salt, brings out the best in others. Um, Without humility, there are no other virtues. And then you go into the story of uh, Oderisi da Gubbio, right? The example of uh, pride in, in Dante's uh, Inferno. So, uh, so, right. so, so, please. So, so, what what happens to uh, so in 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 uh, the in the Paradiso, uh, in Purgatorio? Excuse me. Uh, uh, Dante uh, lands on the terrace, the level called the patio, called Pride. And he meets there an, an artisan uh, who, who's, whose field was illuminating manuscripts. And his name was uh, Odorisi de Gubbio, as you mentioned. And, you know, of course, Dante's walking around basically saying, what are you in for? You know, as if they're in, in prison. And uh, he's Odorisi is weighed down by this arrogance. It's, it's, he strains under this big boulder. It's like Sisyphus, right? The myth of Sisyphus. Um, and it, and this, this, Boulder bends him double. So Dante asks him, asks him, you know, what is this about? And and so Odorisi tells him the story that that in life he was very 
disdainful of another artist by the name of Franco of Bologna, even though he knew Franco was a better artist. And Mm. so he tore Franco down unfairly in order to raise himself up. And so Odorisi's pride has had blinded his humility um, on earth. And now and now he pays the price. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, of course, in the Middle Ages, they're just fascinated with this notion of virtue. One thing that that I think maybe best it's better to talk about at the end is the notion of moderation. Right. So we live in this we live in this very divided world, right? I mean, it's a 50-50 world. It's not just in the United States where I live. You know, there's far right and far left in lots of countries. And I think in the middle of all of those battles that we see in Africa and Asia and civil war, is there's probably this 80% of people who are sane. Um, but like being a radical is now, a, a being a moderate is now a radical position. Like, I don't know how that happened, but mm-hmm. it's it's... You know, moderation is one of the things, you know, when when Hildegard calls humility the queen of the virtues, right? And delightfully, she does not say king, but she says queen, which is why we love Hildegard so much. Um, you know, it, it's 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 the key to, to everything because, you know, a, a moderate approach mm-hmm. um, is countercultural. I mean, this is what Jesus does, right? So Jesus living in this, you know, coming from this Hebrew tradition, but living in the bad Greco-Roman examples, right? But knowing the good, the difference between virtue and vice, you know, here comes Jesus who blows this whole thing up. So, I mean, you can imagine the Romans freaking out. I mean, just the very notion, right? So whether or not uh, our our listeners are, are Christian, you know, the theology is that God humbles himself by taking on human form, but here's the really important part. That human form is further ennobled. And so when he says, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, mm-hmm. he's not talking about the whips, but those who are lower on a social scale through by dint of being born that way or losing in a battle and being a POW, being taken as a slave. And, you know, these are the people that the Romans just trashed and manual labor which of course was the work of slaves you know jesus is saying that there's a dignity to humility a dignity to manual labor so when he says things like the first shall be last and the last shall be first and the leader should serve and here he's washing the feet of his disciples and those who exalt themselves shall be humbled and those who humble themselves shall be exalted you know the romans don't know what to do with this right they just like they don't get it. And and so you can see where this Jewish, Christian, and now Muslim concept of humility all kind of fold together, right? So I, I, I repeatedly ask Muslim scholars, I am not a scholar of Islam. I am not Muslim. Mm-hmm. And I repeatedly said, what's the word for humble? And every single one of them said, oh, we don't have one. It's related to and, and a word that kept coming up, apart from the fundamental submission and stance toward Allah, is patience. Mm. Patience is part mm. of it. It's Patience is tied to a positive or a healthy sense of meekness. So I can, if I can give you an example from a Hadith uh, collection, um, uh, charity does not increase wealth. No one forgives except that Allah increases his honor and no one humbles himself for the sake of Allah, except that Allah raises his status. And mm-hmm. there's a clear correlation there between that Muslim notion and the Christian notion of anyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and those who mm-hmm. humble themselves shall be exalted. I mean, there's a clear line there, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're coming out of the ancient world, and if we can put Islam into the late antique world or the early medieval mm-hmm. world, you've got these two strands that are kind of competing with each other mm-hmm. and they go clanging into the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You mean the still the Greco-Roman more and then the theistic, right? Yeah, right, e- exactly. Mm-hmm. E- except remembering that, that we have to realize that Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are more in line with that m- more positive theory theistic uh, mm. uh, version. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, because it, it, the let's say the tasting version, and uh, you you it, it seems to me ra more radical and 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 almost like a singularity, right? Humility is mm -hmm. once you step out of it. I mean, you're start, you're you're all, already in danger in in danger territory, right? You cite uh, the very <laughs> the book, page one twenty seven. You cite the famous passage from C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters, right? And that's yes, uh, right. Uh, can you read that? Uh, uh, you... Right. So, so for those who don't, um, for those who uh, don't recall, so it's 1942 uh, when C.S. Lewis is writing the Scrooge tape letters, which, as many of his uh, books, be, you know, began as radio addresses. Mm -hmm. And of course, 1942 is not a high point of humility in world history. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story is that uh, Screw Tape is an undersecretary in hell. It's just just such a delicious uh, premise, and he's writing to his nephew, and his nephew is named Wormwood, great name, and Wormwood has been assigned his first soul, and the soul is referred to as the patient, mm -hmm. and the 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 goal is to make sure that the patient embraces vice, not virtue, because if the patient embraces virtue then the the wormwood and screw tape side the devil side will lose to the enemy and it's always in the text capitalized so the enemy is um is uh is god and so uh what he's doing here is he's playing with this notion you know look at look at how humble i am right mm -hmm. so this is screw tape advising wormwood on how to corrupt the soul of this patient mm -hmm. your patient has become humble have you drawn his attention to this fact catch him at the moment when he is really poor in spirit and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection by jove i'm being humble and almost immediately pride pride at his own humility will appear if he awakes to the danger and tries to smother this new form of pride, make him proud of his attempt. And, and, and so I think what, you know, it really captures the, the, the different levels um, of, uh, of, uh, of irony that's going on here. And, and it seems to be, if you read the other paragraphs in this letter, that Wormwood's patient is really kind of uh, enjoying humility because he had been very self-absorbed and now he's helping others and that's bringing him much greater joy so this is terrible in the eyes of screw tape this is the this, this is an alarm bell and so screw tape continues you must therefore conceal from the patient the true end of humility let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness but as a certain kind of opinion namely a low opinion of his own talents and character some talents I gather he really has. Mm -hmm. Fix it in his mind, the idea that humility consists in trying to believe those talents to be less valuable than he believes them to be. So he's saying, you know, pull him to the two strands, the two wings of the Aristotelian notion. Either pull him to hubris or pull him um, to humiliation, but don't let him settle in that nice balanced middle of the true the the true um good pride or the true act of of humility mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, okay great one of the most fascinating chapters of the book is chapter four right chapter chapter uh, one is uh, uh, just to summarize it uh, chapter one is ancient notions in humility uh, chapter two is humility in a biblical key Chapter three is a medieval golden age, and we I think we've got a little bit of in a few insights and and facets from each of the chapters. Um, the chapter four is a paradox of learned ignorance, and the title might be a little cryptic for for people who are not familiar with that tradition in the Middle Ages. So I'm going to ask uh, Chris to to unpack that a little bit uh, and and explain what the tradition of learned ignorance is all about. Um, after that, right, we so have... for... yeah, please go ahead. Well, for me, I mean, I'm a medievalist, right? So, of course, the most important uh, 
uh, chapters are going to be the one are, are, are going to be those two chapters right um which I, which i think are the heart of the book um uh chapters three and four a, a medieval golden age and the paradoxes of learning ignorance um it, because it's in my wheelhouse okay um but also i i think and again you know this is an age of faith as it's sometimes been called but um the uh period um of the of the middle ages has a lot to offer even if you are not a person of faith um today and 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 what the middle ages got right and i'm going to use their language but again you don't have to be a person of faith is the balance between faith and reason fides et ratio right so so what uh let's take the let's take the example of abelard right so this abelard is this 12th century uh, a philosopher and teacher. People know kind of the salacious story about Abelard and Eloise. And uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, the founder of the Cistercian order um, in North America, known uh, uh, recognized typically as the Trappist, such as Thomas Merton. Um, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux kind of goes after Abelard, not because he's anti-intellectual, that's a caricature of Bernard of Clairvaux, but because Abelard has no guardrails. So what, what Abelard and others are doing, and again, they're benefiting greatly from Jewish and Islamic thought, um, is, is he says, we've got a lot of open questions and we've got a lot of contradictory rulings and teaching. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book that's called Yes and No, Seek et Non. And I'm going to say, here's an argument, here's a discussion, and, and it, here are the arguments for it, and here are the arguments against it, and then I'm going to synthesize this, right? So this is even before Thomas Aquinas writes the Summa Theologica. He doesn't invent the scholastic method, but it's kind of bubbling along, and Abelard is the best example among several um, of, of this process of doing what? Of realizing that all of those rulings that say yes and no don't have all the answers, that there's good in both the yes and there's good in both the no, and where there are contradictions, let's try to steer the middle course. So we praise Abelard because he's an example of doing just that, right? Trying to find, trying to take the emotion out of things and trying to find the steady course. But there is an arrogance to that too. And the arrogance, the temptation is that we can figure it all out. And it's that it's that we can take this as far as we can, and then we can't take it any further. That's Bernard of Clairvaux's position, and he's afraid that Abelard is going to kind of go too fast, right? So, I mean, to be gloriously anachronistic here, it's kind of like, I think it's a great idea that we can use stem cells to grow a new kidney for someone, because then maybe someone can live a longer life. But do I want people to start deciding whether they want their kids to have brown eyes or blue eyes and somebody doing that in a test tube, that freaks me out um, and makes me nervous, right? So where is the line in all of this? And and the, the kind of answer is this thing called learned ignorance, right? Which is very big in the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian tradition. And that is that I recognize my limits. And so you have a lot of reformers, educational reformers who say, let's let's be careful here, okay? So let's use some of the words that they use. Like there's this thing called, I, I tell my students, there's a difference among information, knowledge, and wisdom, right? Information is anything I get off the internet and they just presume it has to be correct because it's on the internet, right? Knowledge is, is when you take all of that stuff off the internet and start talking about what makes sense and what is logical and what can be verified by facts. Wisdom is entirely different from that. One need not be educated to be wise, right? You've got these, you know, we, we all have the example of a, of a, a great-grandfather or a nona in my own tradition who may not be educated at all, but is the wisest person you would never make a life decision without talking to that person. And so in the Middle Ages, what they're saying is, yes, we can get ciencia, we can get information, and maybe we can get knowledge. But that we have to recognize that that doesn't make us wise. This is what Socrates found out, or the people at Socrates' questions found out about themselves, which is why he was so annoying. Um, and so 
you have someone like Jean Gerson, who's the chancellor of the University of Paris. So he would kind of be the equivalent of a provost in, you know, roughly in an American university setting. And, you know, he he does this educational reform and he says, let's be very careful about curiositas for its own sake, right? So the cliche, curiosity killed a cat, right? So why are we studying? We're studying to understand things so that we can be better people, so that we can serve others, not so we can strut around and say that we know it all, not that we can, like Odorisi, champion ourselves by trashing others, Franco of Bologna in Dante's story. And so Gerson has this really delicious line where he says, discretion is the daughter of humility, right? Discretion is the daughter of humility. So now we begin to see what Hildegard was talking about when when she says that none of the other virtues know what to do without the mother, without the queen of humility. And, And it's a very medieval concept, yes, but it's grounded in that Socratic idea that he is wise because he knows nothing, right? So if we're talking now about humility as self effacement in the service and learning of others, well, if I'm going to be a medical doctor, I have to be self assured and educated and know what I can heal and know what I can't heal. Know what I can heal and know what I can't heal. And so to use another example, someone that I study, Nicholas of Cusa, also known as Cusanus, who lived in the 1400s, the example that he uses, and as a philosopher, Adrian, you'll of course love this, right? Um, is that, that all of knowledge, God's knowledge is a circle. And our knowledge is a polygon inside that circle. And no matter how close we mathematically get that polygon to be a circle, it will never be a circle. And at that point, you don't say, I'm stupid. What you say is, this is as far as I can take it right now. And I hand it off to the next generation. And then the next generation, I mean, to use a silly example, it's kind of like having a DNA sample from 1951, but not have, you know, having a blood sample from 1951, but not the technique of a DNA analysis that you have in 1991 to solve the crime, right? So uh, so learned ignorance to me is it's something that I try to teach my, I, I try to remind myself to live my life like this, but I try to help students understand this as well. And what's really interesting for me as we as we're moving into a world now, you know, 15th, 16th century, we have the kind of this creeping constitutionalism. Of course, that's part of the recovery of the, the Greek polis, um, is this notion that my knowledge and my skills are related to a common good. That that if I am good at something and bad at nine other things, that I need to get nine other people who are good at those other things. And together we can form a community, right? And, and you know, there's this cliche that the Middle Ages was all about the community and the modern world is all about individualism. We can knock both of those cliches down. But there is a sense of the common good that you get in the in the Middle Ages that begins to get trumped a bit in the medieval, in the early modern and modern world, with this rise of individualism, which is not a bad thing, right? You know, like, like, let's try to figure all this out. But if it doesn't have limits, I'm thinking of Blaise Pascal, right? So Pascal, who, 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 um, you know, is, 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 is a mathematician and a philosopher, but he also has this very intense uh, experience of God, right? And he writes this note that he sews into his coat to remind him of it. That says, and the note reads, fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Now he's putting that in religious terms. But, you know, it's this notion that that no matter how much I know, I still have to get zapped when there's stuff that I don't know. Uh, yeah, and Thank you. Um, now, this tradition then somehow is eroded and eventually more or less collapses, right, with the emergence of early modernity and mm-hmm. the emergence of early, you know, the scientific project. And you, you do a wonderful job in explaining the different nuances of that project. On the one hand, you have Hume, and maybe we'll cite that passage from Hume on page 111, who completely disparages and discards the humility project 
uh, along with um, Prince Albert um, <laughs> as well. But then you have uh, people like like Bacon and Darwin who who still preserve a little bit of uh, and uh, and then Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, who 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 are aware of the danger of hubris of the uh, and and still preserve a little bit this concern not to become hubristic. Um, and and um, so so maybe let's let's cite that passage of of, of yeah who, let's which, let, let's contrast what? those two right so if you were, if you were going to do like if you were a casting director of a Hollywood movie and you said I want an enlightenment skeptic who thinks nothing is good comes from religion they would say you know call David Hume right mm-hmm. and and the 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 best slash worst passage example of this it comes from his treatise on human nature where he says and i'm quoting hume every valuable quality of the mind whether of the imagination judgment memory or disposition wit good sense <laughs> learning courage justice integrity all these are the causes of pride and their opposites of humility humility is shame not satisfaction of our looks skills, positions, and accomplishments. And then you have these cautionary tales. And the two examples I'll give you here are Christopher Marlowe's Tragical History of Dr. Faustus, modeled after a real person, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, right? So the, the story of Dr. Faustus is familiar to us, an alchemist who wants to, who, who, who sells his soul to the devil. Of course, this story is replicated in many, many cultures. In the United States, we have the devil and Daniel Webster. And at the end of this tragical history of Dr. Faustus, which kind of reminds me of Voldemort and Tom Riddle and, and Harry Potter. At the end of it, as, as Faustus is essentially descending into hell, we have this passage from Marlowe. So this is in the, the late 1500s. Cut is the branch, speaking of Faustus, cut is the branch that might have grown full straight and burned is Apollo's laurel bough that sometime grew within this learned man. Faustus is gone, regard his hellish fall, whose fiendful fortune may exhort the wise only to wonder at unlawful things, whose deepness doth entice such forward wits to practice more than heavenly power permits. So those there, there's your guardrails, right? There's your guardrails. And so Mary Shelley, and of course the great story of Mary Shelley outwriting her friends in this writing competition, uh, you know, these are rich people who have villas and they're in, I think it's near Lake Como. Um, and uh, it's a dreary summer day and she's dozing, taking an afternoon nap. And she has this image of, of this body being reanimated. And, and, and she, at the age of 19, writes um, Frankenstein. And so if I can contrast two passages from this, one is early when Victor Frankenstein um, goes to university and is just taken by this notion that we can figure it all out. So Frankenstein, young in his career, says, no one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards like a hurricane in the first enthusiasm of success. Life and death appeared to me ideal bounds which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. And of course, we know the story that he loses control of the creature um, who causes a great deal of mayhem because he's rejected And so at the end of the story, which mirrors the end of the story of Faustus, although instead of Faustus speaking here, Mary Shelley allows us to hear directly from Victor Frankenstein, his life and other the lives of others destroyed by this creature he couldn't control. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge and how much happier that man is who believes his native town to be the world than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. And of course, Percy Bysshe Shelley, um, her husband writes the famous story of Ozymandias, right? I'm walking along a desert. I see 
two like calves, right? The bottom half of somebody's legs. Obviously, this was a gigantic statue. And and there's a there's a there's an inscription that reads, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty in despair. And then Percy Bysshe Shelley tells us, well, nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sand stretch far away. So we have these kind of cautionary tales. Yeah, and in spite of these cautionary tales, and uh, uh, here we are, right? And uh, we're all now. We're I think the issue of AI might have arisen in with all its force after you finish the book, because now we're we're dealing with another. Frankenstein type of of temptation, right? With uh, uh, the 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 entire AI issue, which is an entire conversation conversation in itself. Uh, and I think this book, uh, you know, is a good reminder, if not a warning. But um, I just, one vignette that you bring in the chap chapter five: modernity forgets and starts to remember. Uh, nicely put is is Ben Franklin and it, and I think that right. this example is is very important for, especially for for Americans right in I mean it, it, it's it's very beautiful right uh, the, the the way he uh, page one fifteen he he you you recount how he um, adds as a goal for himself imitate Jesus and Socrates. Right, and then how he retrieves and rediscovers uh, a tradition of learned ignorance. Where I forbid, even forbid myself the use of every word or expression in the language that imported a fixed opinion, such as cert certainly, undoubtedly, and I adopted instead of them. I conceive, I apprehend, or I imagine a thing to be or so, or it so appears to me at present. Right, which. Um, ben Franklin, who is who is not necessarily a trained philosopher, but a very much a handyman, a, a scientist, but a very practical man, right? So in a way, shows how there is a need of a, a return to a certain common sense, or as as an attempt to be more grounded. To to uh, and and that maybe that's that's a reminder and a warning again for uh, academics and academia. <laughs> were very easily yeah, you know, go please. Yeah, well, as, as a teacher, um, e even before AI, I would always say to my students, "Why, why would you cheat when you can think?" Um, and and I think particularly when you're dealing with younger college freshmen, sophomores, uh, and I teach a, a working class population, uh, one third of my students are first gen for college. I think that that which reminds me of my own grandparents. Um, all of whom came through Ellis Island, um, that some of them don't think they belong there. Some of them don't think that that they have enough smarts. And so they, they might cheat because they think that what they can find is better than what they can come up with on their own. And so I have discussions with them is why would you go to AI? You know, why would you take someone else's ideas what that means is you don't have enough confidence in your own idea. So let's talk about why you don't have that confidence. Right. Um, and it's very easy to, you know, when your students start putting whilst and the word honor has a U in it, um, you know, it's very easy to catch, to catch this kind of thing. Um, but it's all, it's also this notion that why are you presuming that the AI has a better insight than you do? You know, so, you know, I, I also want to build, this is why I talk about proper pride. I want to build confidence in my students. Humility doesn't mean I'm stupid. Humility means I know X amount and there's more to learn. And the more to learn comes in my classes and looking at primary sources that contradict each other and trying to figure out the Venn diagram of what's likely to have happened and, and analysis. So I think what I'm trying to cultivate in my students, I think what I'm I hope I'm trying to offer in this book um, is, is that humility is kind of a disposition. It's like a fundamental disposition, or you could use, I don't know, what other word you want to use? Posture, stance, attitude, right? It's a healthy state of mind. It's a sense of perspective and proportion. Where do I fit in within this 
larger world. And once, I mean, this is in some sense, this is kind of, you know, though I didn't write the book as a commentary on current events, in the epilogue, I did ask myself, well, we've done this history of humility. You know, what is the takeaway? So famous Jesuit church historian named John O'Malley, who passed away in 2022, he would always at the end of his, his class meetings or even public lectures say, so what? So we spent, you know, an hour and a half on the 16th century. So what? What's the takeaway? So, you know, so what? Well, you know, if I can offer this, I think the so what is that once you embrace humility as a virtue and not a vice, automatically it moves monologue to dialogue because you have to listen to other people, right? And, and, and if you have to listen to other people, it's grounded in self-awareness and self-reflection and fixing our flaws. That's why Erev Yom Kippur is a good example, which I didn't come up with. My was was brought to me by this rabbi uh, partner, and and there's an awful lot of st- I find stubbornness in the world. This imposing my view on others, not by because I'm making a better argument, but because I'm I'm essentially being a bully, right? I'm bulldozing you by imposing my views on others. And what does that do? It doesn't convince anybody. It just engenders, you know, people. I, as I said, I, I feel like there's this big middle, this radical moderate position. And, and, and sometimes, you know, if you turn on two different radio stations or two different television stations, you know, a number of my students, and I, I'm wondering if they themselves come from families where they had feuding parents who may have divorced, say that that listening to the radio and watching TV and watching the, um, at least the, speaking from the American political scene, is like watching two parents who hate each other argue all the time. Um, so I don't see a lot of humility in our public discussions today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's definitely this public aspect, along with right uh, it also the culture of competition, right? That a lot of our students are involved in right the rat race you are there you have mm-hmm. to prove yourself you have to compete and you have to promote yourself right uh mm-hmm. along with this you know you 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 and 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 i think that's why the 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 call for humility is very timely and you you emphasize that it's a practice it's something you learn it's not something theoretical but it's something that that you you need to to practice, right? It, it's not a one time thing, but you know, I'm I'm not sure if I say I'm pessimistic, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, and I, I think another use you good use for humility is this uh, taking away pressure, right? Given the rat race, given the competitive competitiveness, especially f- the pressure that first time college students have they have to perform they have to prove themselves it's it's a huge amount of pressure and uh, it's daunting and uh, a lot of these issues with anxiety that and mental health that we see a rise in 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 um, college in in, edu- in higher education could be i think mitigated or if not by uh, humility by re- remembering or retrieving humility but um i'm i'm not sure how, how let's say realistic that is i'm i'm a believer in humility myself but the the competition out there is so 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 you know violent sometimes that you know they have a hard time embracing something that seems to undermine that competitiveness um i don't know yeah and, and also i also i think i mean as so i'm a i'm a husband and i'm a father and i i know i felt uh, uh, in the spring of 2020 when we were going into lockdown this tremendous feeling of being powerful powerless and this and maybe it's it's caught up in some sort of macho paternal culture you know i have to keep my family safe and then i was faced with i might not be able to keep my family safe there there may be forces that are larger around here and so we've got to make some decisions as a family you know um and uh, Hmm. 
and and COVID was a humbling experience. And I wonder if we blew that opportunity to learn mm -hmm. um, because I mean, you know, however you feel about masks, whether they're right, whether they're wrong, whether they're good or whether they're bad. As I look back, what we said was wear a mask to protect other people. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason that people weren't wearing masks were like, well, you can't tell me what to do. But if we told people wear a mask to protect yourself, everybody would have worn a mask because our default, I mean, there's nothing wrong with protecting, you know, physically protecting yourself or protecting your family, of course, right? Um, that's the responsible action. But beyond that, beyond that, you know, very intimate and, and basic stance, what is our responsibility to the community, to the common good? And, and this is what and, and I'm sure that political philosophers will tell me, and I'm not a political mm -hmm. philosopher and I'm not an historian mm -hmm. of the American experience, but just, you know, approaching 60, uh, you know, there are ebbs and flows and trends. And it seems to me that there are times where in e pluribus unum, where we've been emphasizing mm -hmm. the unum, and then there are others where we've been em emphasizing the e pluribus. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the problem is that we make it e, you know, we say many or one when you know, again, that the Middle Ages understood the balance. It's many and one. Mm -hmm. It's the individual and the common good. They're not in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. And and I my hope is that not only can we be more humble as individuals, but that mm -hmm. we can be more humble as communities. But we can't be more humble as communities unless we're more humble as individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful way to to summarize it. Um, thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, what what are you, you? What's what's the next project about? What's next? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know because this was the first time in my life where the idea for the next book didn't arise while I was working on this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine if this is my last book. I continue to write uh, scholarly articles on. 15th century church history and reform mm -hmm. and things like that with lots of footnotes because a geek mm -hmm. like me thinks that's fun. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I don't have another book project. Um, and, and, and if I get another one, that's fine. And if I don't, that's fine. That's fine too. <laughs> Ending in a very humble way. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I said that I said you didn't say it. <laughs> okay. But I'm very grateful that you, that you, devoted your uh the new books network um uh, chose this book and i'm grateful to you for doing so particularly yeah thank you chris